Hello, and welcome to Public Service Podcast with your host, Jordan Cooper, interviewing neighborhood activist, uh, Abby Milstein, who is the founder of Power Up Montco. This is episode four of uh, Public Interest Podcast, where we interview activists, uh, advocates, and politicians about the public interest. So welcome, Abby. Thank you, Jordan. So Abby, please uh, tell our listeners about what you currently do to advance the public interest and what you've done in the past to advance the public interest. Currently, uh, I have an email list Mm -hmm. that is very involved in power utility issues, particularly PEPCO power Mm -hmm. utility issues. And a few years ago, you may remember we had the derecho come through our community and knock out power for many days. For our listeners, what is a derecho? Sorry, the derecho is a very strong straight wind Uh uh, that has enormous power and enormous uh, force and comes across an area and really wreaks devastation. And what happened when the derecho came through the Lux Manor, uh, Bethesda, Maryland area? So the derecho came through in 2012. Okay. uh, In midsummer and toward the end of uh, the summer, we ended up having no power. It knocked down trees. It knocked down utility poles. Mm -hmm. It brought down power lines. And who is a power utility in this area? In this area, it's currently Pepco, but Pepco has recently been acquired by a company called Exelon. Exelon. And Exelon is a very, very large, multi-billion dollar corporation that has utility companies all over the East Coast and the Midwest. It owns nuclear power plants, Mm -hmm. and it has a lot of other subsidiaries as well. So was was Pepco at fault? Uh, when the derecho was there something they could have done differently to restore the power or prevent the outage? So that's what the question became when we started, when I started Power Up Monco and without power for five days, my kids had no food and mm-hmm. you know, got very frustrated. And I said, what's going on here? Right. And that was sort of the question that was at the crux of the whole issue was what is going on here? And what it turned out to be was that uh, just a few years before I got involved, mm-hmm. there had been a determination by the Public Service Commission that mm-hmm. Pepco had been in the Now, bottom. what is the Public Service Commission for our listeners? Sure. The Maryland Public Service Commission, and many states have these, mm-hmm. is the commission that assigns rates to uh-huh. utility companies and has oversight over their performance and function and is basically a state-level uh, auditor, if you will, or should be, of the public's interest in our utilities, our public utilities. And I'll just add uh, for our listeners that the Public Service Commission has been given authority by the Maryland General Assembly to regulate uh, Pepco Electric Utility as well as other um, entities around the state of Maryland. Pepco being uh, a monopoly in this market agreed in in exchange for getting a monopoly to have uh, the rates that rate payers who buy electricity um, from the distribution grid of Pepco, uh, the uh, Public Service Commission sets the prices that Pepco charges ratepayers to purchase the electricity. Okay, so go on. So you were saying that the PSC the PSC had uh, had a number of rate cases of Pepco's prior to the derecho, and right. a number of reliability cases that came up. And during that process, mm-hmm. uh, it was actually an attorney who was working for Montgomery County at the time yeah. established that Pepco had been in the bottom quartile of reliability in the nation. The bottom quartile. Bottom quartile for many, many years. So essentially yeah. what had happened. Bottom quartile in one of the wealthier areas of the United States. Well, yes. Um, Montgomery County is a pretty wealthy county, but bottom quartile in terms of... So the whole country, they're getting better service than we are with some of the most educated population and some of the wealthiest population. And here you are. Um, now, were you paid to be this a- activist a- advocate, or, or why are you doing this? Is this how? Why? It seems like it's benefiting the public. Tell me, why are you doing this? What's your, you're not getting paid for it? No, and we don't take money. Uh, we've had a couple of sponsors. Mm-hmm. ARP has sponsored an event, which I know uh, you attended at one point. Mm-hmm. As did several uh, Maryland state delegates and people running for the state senate, as mm-hmm. well as the governorship right. uh, at that time. And what? What I saw as being important was education Mm -hmm. of elected officials when it came to power utility issues. Rate making is a very complicated process, and it involves a lot of economic policy and theories, and a lot of Sadies and Safies, Safies (laughs) Safies and Sadies. Which, for our listeners, basically refers to the duration and frequency of an electrical power outage. 
And the rate cases themselves are very complex formulas of what a utility company needs to continue running, which they do need money from its consumers to continue running, but it has to be balanced with a need for the customers to have reliable power, affordable power, and hopefully energy efficient power. So if the Public Service Commission is not doing their job, what do you see? You see ratepayers paying what in exchange for what? So what was happening was PEPCO and other utilities like it were coming to the Public Service Commission for many, many years and asking for rate increase requests. Mm -hmm. And the Public Service Commission was granting these requests mm -hmm. year after year after year. So customers are paying more and more money over time in exchange for what? Well, that was the problem. Worse and worse service? Poor and poor reliability, poor and poor customer service. And over time, the infrastructure was deteriorating mm -hmm. uh, that PEPCO controlled. Now so, what if you don't want PEPCO? You're like, you know what, I hate paying these rates for, for bad electrical service. They're not, I'm not, I don't even get electricity. You know, what's my other option? So right now in the state of Maryland, uh, there was a, a law passed uh, by the prior governor, mm -hmm. which allowed decoupling. Mm -hmm. And what that means is that your distribution mm -hmm. will always be by PEPCO slash Exelon. Because they have a monopoly over the lines, but the generation, mm -hmm. you can actually opt out of PEPCO's generation and you can opt for other kinds of generation power. power. So yeah. basically, if I don't like PEPCO, I can either buy a diesel generator in my backyard and power my own house off the grid, or I can choose to buy electricity from some other power generator, but is, if, if I'm not gonna be generating my own electricity, then that means I need to use Pepco's distribution monopoly infrastructure in order to get power even from another source. So I'm almost obligated by law to pay the rates that the PSC sets for these services with Pepco. The distribution service. And I don't really have a choice. So that's kind of where you're advocating for the public interest because people are kind of forced to pay. You have a cornered market. Um, and they're forced to pay these rates even if the service is unreliable. So it's not a capitalist system. It's a business that doesn't deliver that people have to keep paying for. Right, and that's where the Maryland Public Service Commission comes in because they are supposed to be guaranteeing mm -hmm. reliable, affordable rates. Right. And they're also supposed to be guaranteeing reliability. It's, it's written in their, their code. The problem was, was that the commission for years had never bothered to ask PEPCO where the reliability rankings, the Safety and Safety, Safety right. and Safety that you were suggesting. Which, by the way, just to remind you, are acronyms. They are very complicated, but again, duration and frequency of outages, Safety and Safety. So a reliability case was brought before the commission mm -hmm. uh, by an attorney who you have listened to, Stan Bayless, mm -hmm. who's now retired, and uh, he established with the commission that the commission had not done its job, mm -hmm. and it had never really dug into the issue of reliability for PEPCO, mm -hmm. and when it finally did, mm -hmm. um, it was pretty bad because the commission realized that they had not ever requested from PEPCO the reliability ratings, and yet they kept granting rate increases. So what are some of the things that you would like to see PEPCO do, or now Exelon, to improve their reliability and, and the actual uh, electri service of electricity to ratepayers? So when the PEPCO acquisition came about mm -hmm. and the merger was Approved. sort of finalized. There are appeals going on, in fact, in various places like D.C. and even Maryland here. Um, the thing that came out of it, one of the issues that came out of the, the case mm. in the merger was that there needed to be better reliability. And there, How do you achieve that? How do you achieve that? So you have to invest mm -hmm. in the infrastructure. What's an example of how you would? Would you put the lines underground? Would you cut tree limbs? Uh, I'm not personally a fan of undergrounding for a lot of reasons, which we won't go into right now. Mm -hmm. um, but in terms of vegetation management, which is what you're talking about, the tree trimming, mm -hmm. the, um, you know, line clearing, making sure that there's, you know, adequate mm -hmm. ventilation and circulation around lines, that's one thing. Replacing old lines, replacing old poles, replacing old transformers and things that are no longer really um, considered modern technologies. Mm -hmm. And I know I took a walk with uh, Delegate Alcar a couple of years back, mm -hmm. and just as a layman's view of the infrastructure, you mm -hmm. can see that 
the the lines and the poles were deteriorating and collapsing. Now, now, wasn't there something where there was a labor force for Pepco that knew the lines in this area, and they were kind of laid off, and then you have people coming from out of town who don't really know the area, and there's less of a labor force, and they just don't even have the employees to maintain the infrastructure. So one of the criticisms that came about after the derecho was mm -hmm. that the linemen, which is what I think you're referring to, mm -hmm. um, they were sort of aging out of the system. Mm -hmm. And rather than PEPCO doing the responsible, pr prudent thing, mm -hmm. which is training new people to come and replace those folks, mm -hmm. and it takes a long time to re retrain and replace linemen. It's not a, a quick process. Yeah. Um, PEPCO was letting the older people sort of age out mm -hmm. and not replacing them with younger people. So there's a labor workforce shortage yeah, issue. Yeah, and they when they did have issues like the derecho, yeah. um, they had fewer and fewer experienced people to be able to come in and replace and repair. The so there weren't enough people to really handle the volume of repairs needed if an emergency event kind of happens. And then what would they do? They'd import people from West Virginia, Virginia, Pennsylvania, and those people, would they fit make the, the uh, fixes to the infrastructure as quickly as the people who, other, who were previously here would have? I'm sure that they have highly qualified and trained people that they brought in. The problem mm -hmm. is, is that you had to go, because the derecho covered such a large area, yeah. you had to go very far out of the, the geographic area to get the people who were qualified to yeah. come in. And in PEPCO's lining up of people to come in, um, PEPCO definitely cuts corners when it comes to pulling in these extra crews and waiting till the last minute to get crews, and that that's really part of the mismanagement of Pepco's. So let's bring the conversation a little bit more back to Abby Milstein. So you have this email listserv you call Power Up Monco. You send out a newsletter, you do some research, you're doing this on your own time and you're not remunerated. Why? What's driving you? What's your motivation here? Are you, are you passionate about Sadies and Safies and you've been dreaming about that for the last two decades? Or is there something else that's really motivating you, that's really gets your blood going? I, my background was in law for a long time mm -hmm. and then I moved from law to the Hill and mm -hmm. from the Hill I moved to a think tank and from the think tank I went into um, what I'll call hardcore politics. Mm -hmm. and I hardcore politics? Hardcore politics. <laughs> <laughs> what is that? <laughs> running, running federal races. Okay. And uh, being involved in, in the everyday, you know. Pretty exciting, huh? Getting people elected. Um, it can, it certainly can be. Uh, it's a lot of work. It's a lot of hard work and it's a lot of, you have to be dedicated to your, your candidate and focused on that candidate's needs. Uh -huh. And um, I know there's a lot of discussion right now with some of the candidates that are out there, but uh, it is hard work and you have to be on your, on your game every day. And it's so you were you were doing some political work, you're doing some policy work, doing some campaign work, you know, okay. And then and then and what then happened? I became a stay-at-home mom and my priority shifted and I decided that, you know, it was important for me to be with my children and teach them and be with them and one of the things that I have always been able to do is mobilize people and get people interested or educated, educated predominantly on issues, whether it's social justice issues or, you know, my, my background was in child abuse and neglect and things uh -huh. like that. So transitioning over to utility law was a big challenge for me because it wasn't something I had a policy background in, though I had been on the Hill and I had worked in mm -hmm. public policy on different issues. So I had to educate myself. And once I became educated, um, I thought it was really important to educate others. Interesting. So you're leaving your career to spend time with your family. And when you're with your family, you're leaving your family to spend time on now a career in advocacy that's not remunerated. So you're still, this is, is it not taking time away from your family? It does. I'd usually, um, when I would work on the writings and analyzing the cases, mm -hmm. and when I would do the interventions at the Public Service Commission, I'd mm -hmm. usually be up, I'd put my kids to bed, and then I'd be up late at night working on things. So I tried not to let it interfere. And I have brought my kids, as a lot of people know, to public hearings, uh -huh. uh, to So what's that teach your children? Like if their mother is doing all this work for the public interest, what what type of citizen does, does that make? What type of woman will your daughter be in the future having grown up going to public service commission uh, uh, meetings, hearings, and listening to their mother testify? 
That's interesting that you asked that because uh, it's been a process and she's obviously watched me over these years. And mm -hmm. I think in the beginning it was sort of frustrating for her. She didn't understand why I was being, why she was being dragged and why I was taking her to Annapolis and taking her to these commission hearings mm -hmm. and, you know, driving her places she didn't want to go. But now um, that she's older, I think she's very grateful and she tells me that she's grateful that I showed her these other worlds and I introduced her to other people and now she's very much interested in public service and, uh, you know, is considering medical school. So Interesting. So how, so you're, you're very good at mobilizing people and uh, there's an issue where you felt like you could make a difference. So you're going to go ahead and advocate. How has this um, affected both you um, and, and other people's perception of you and your profile in the political world? And then how has this accept, how has this impacted the political world directly? Meaning how has it affected those candidates who you invited to the forum, has it changed the public discourse at all? Has it, have you found that elected officials and candidates have become more responsive to these issues that you care about? I think what's happened over the couple of years that we've been engaged in this activity is we've brought a level of knowledge to a core constituency of people in public service, mm -hmm. whether they were elected or they weren't elected. The fact of the matter is, is that they have a broader understanding now, something that they really didn't have any understanding of before. Mm -hmm. And for me, whether I did public policy or I was in campaigns, the goal was always education for people about the process. Education of both the electorate and the politicians? Both. Now, is that, is, are those different processes? It can be a different process. Uh, it depends on the candidate and it depends on, you know, the group that you're talking to. I mean, I talk to homeowners associations. I talk to um, community civic groups about what I do. I encourage people to write to the commission when they're not happy mm -hmm. about the way things are going. I, having been in public service, I think there needs to be a, a flow. And that flow in recent years seems to me to have really been stymied. So you're also, you mentioned community groups. Now, correct me, you are the leader of, of an organization. What is the name? Of, what's your role in that organization? What's the name of that organization? So currently I serve uh, my community, Lux Manor, as the president of the Civic Association. Mm -hmm. And uh, I follow in very large footsteps, uh -huh. yours, in <laughs> having served uh, after you in that role. And, uh, and it's, it's been an interesting two years. So on the topic of public service, you're both serving in a non-remunerated capacity for, as president of the Lux Manor Citizens Association, but you're also an advocate on Power Up Monco. So how would you compare and contrast those two different roles, which are both volunteer roles that you're doing supposedly to improve the well-being of your community? Well, I think one of the things I've been able to do as president is bring a lot of the information mm -hmm. that I work on with Power Up Monco to the community. And that's been pivotal because the more people, again, you can educate mm -hmm. about the role of the Public Service Commission, about you know what's going on in Annapolis and how those two entities interact. Do you feel like public education efforts that you have uh, initiated have applied pressure to political to, to elected officials through the constituency that you've been educating? But that's ultimately the goal. Um, you know, whether the Public Service Commission responds or not, that remains to be seen. There are a lot of new commissioners now on the commission, and we currently have a rate case that's wrapping up with the commission mm -hmm. um, from PEPCO mm -hmm. that's coming up, and we'll see how this commission decides. And a long time ago, before I really got deeply involved in this, mm -hmm. we had what I would say more of a co-consumer commission. Mm -hmm. um, currently, we have a lot of commissioners that come from the industry. Right. And that is a concept called regulatory capture, which mm -hmm. means that the industry that is supposed to be regulated... Is regulating itself. Is is putting its people on and right. regulating. So, But just back to the topic. So one, I guess, you're, you're educating the community, and then have you seen the community in, influence politicians? Well, yeah, they show up at the commission hearings now, and people write in, and people write back to me frequently. So not only you, but now other people are applying pressure to politicians yes. because of your efforts. Definitely. Okay. Definitely. And then in terms, so you're educating the community with Power Up Monco, and then explain your role with the Lux Manor Citizens Association and how that pub form of public service is the same, is similar to or dissimilar from your role with Power Up Monco. Well, in terms of the... Lux Manor Citizens Association. It's a civic active 
group that mm-hmm. tries to do good things mm-hmm. for the community. We donate money to schools and we hold forums mm-hmm. and we are about to hold a very important forum, uh, as you know, um, coming up that will address a down ticket ballot uh, campaign on the Board of Education. Mm-hmm. And the Board of Education is, it's funny because when I was in politics, um, very few people would pay attention to down ballot. Sounds like you very much still are in politics. It's not so much of a past tense for you. Uh, I think once you've been in it, if, if the bug gets you, and yeah. it, it definitely bit me when I got into it, it's it's hard to remove yourself because you don't stop thinking um, in those terms ever again. And, and you have, a I think, a deeper appreciation, a deeper understanding of why it's important to put um, consumer pe- consumer advocates and people who are responsible to the community right. into leadership roles. So... Um, well, on that note, I, we're about to wrap up this session. So just one last question I'd like to ask, you know, reflecting upon this, the many years and the many hours that you've put into public service. Um, I mean, I guess if you were just to speak to the listeners about what really motivates you, what, what public service means to you, why you do it, why you give so much of yourself, I mean, how would you respond to that? Uh, I think while we're here on Earth, we have an obligation to make the world a better place for ourselves, our children, and future generations. And if we don't take up that responsibility and take it upon our own shoulders, then um, then we're really abdicating our roles on the planet. And we're all given a limited time here, and I've always seen it as my role to try to make it a little bit better than the role that I the, and the world that I came into. Well, that's it. Thank you so much, Abby Milstein. This is the conclusion of Episode 4 of Public Interest Podcast with your host, Jordan Cooper, where we interview advocates, politicians, uh, and activists in the community who advance the public interest. You heard it straight from the lips of Abby Milstein that public service is something that's incumbent upon all of us because, ultimately, we are the stewards of our own community. Thank you so much for joining us this time, and I'll talk to you next time on Public Interest Podcast.